It's good to see you. Uh, here we are in the fellowship hall for a, a worship service that's a little less formal than usual. Uh, we will be seeing some slides during the sermon, and that's going to be facilitated by having it darker in here than in the sanctuary. So that's why we're over here. But uh, those of you at home that are comfortable watching this, you should know that they're all sitting at tables, they have their coffee, uh, they're nice and comfortable here as well, so we hope uh, someday soon to see you back here. Uh, let us worship God. Moses saw a burning bush and knew he was on holy ground. We have come to worship God in this holy place. As it was for Moses, so it is for us that God always hears the cries of his people and comes to be with them. So we come with our burdens, our worries, and our requests, and lay them at God's feet. God told Moses, I am, and then asked for commitment in return. So in our worship today, may we hear God's call and respond in faith. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, hear our prayers as we come to you in worship today. Guide our thoughts and feelings, shine light on the paths we should walk, and inspire us to love you and your people more. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
As we approach our time of confession, let's remember that forgiveness is a gift. Our Lord, our Lord offers this gift to all to be forgiven when we confess, repent, and trust in him. Let us respond to this generous invitation by praying our, our prayer of confession as printed in the bulletin, followed by our own personal confessions offered in silence. Let us pray. Eternal God, from the beginning of time, you have called your children into relationship with you. Yet we confess, like all the rest, that we have turned to our way and refused your love and grace. Restore us to the joy of knowing you and of recognizing your reign among us. Through Jesus Christ, who brings us all to the news of forgiveness. Amen. Hear the good news. We are not our own, but were purchased at a measurable cost, the life of Jesus on a cross. Scripture tells us that God's love for us is infinite and covers a multitude of sins. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven.
Thank you, choir. That was beautiful. Our responsive reading today is Psalm 24, which tells of the holy temple where the chosen people worship and from where God's laws and love were learned. Please join me in this reading. The earth and everything on it belong to the Lord. The world and its people belong to him. The Lord placed it all on the oceans and rivers. Who may climb the Lord's hill or stand by his holy temple? Only those who do right for the right reasons and don't worship idols or tell lies under oath. The Lord God who saves them will bless and reward them. Because they worship and serve the God of Jacob. Open the ancient gates so that the glorious king may come in. Who is this glorious king? He is our Lord, a strong and mighty warrior. Open the ancient gates so that the glorious king may come in. Who is this glorious king? He is our Lord, the all-powerful. Our scripture lesson comes to us from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 4, selected verses. Hear the word of God. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. Continue at 18. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left their boat, and their father, and followed him. And that ends our reading. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Kay and I went on a pilgrimage to Israel. And a lot of people have asked us, why did you want to do that? Let me say, to begin with, that Kay and I like to indulge in watching a TV show called Million Dollar Listing. And that's where real estate agents sell multi-million dollar houses in L.A. We watch Josh and the other Josh and Tracy and Edgar sell homes all over Los Angeles. Places that we've never been to. I've never been to L.A. They sell them in Malibu and Beverly Hills and the Bird Streets, whatever they are, Hollywood. And I've seen the houses that they show in the neighborhoods, but I have no idea where they are or what they're like in general. And going to Israel was like that and different. Just like LA, we've never been there before, we've never been to Israel, and didn't have any good sense of the lay of the land. But in LA, someday we hope to be tourists, uh, sightseers. But going to Israel, we wanted a deeper experience. So we went as pilgrims. Now, there's a difference between a tourist and a pilgrim. A tourist just wants to see the sights. A pilgrim wants to go and have a spiritual experience. We wanted to deepen our faith and walk where Jesus walked and experience and feel this journey, not just learn some facts and see some pretty churches. So if you've ever been there yourself, or if you haven't, in the season of Lent, Please journey with us as we show you some of our pilgrimage. And remember that part of the pilgrimage is experiencing it and feeling it. So if you begin to feel feelings while you're watching these pictures, these photos, let those feelings rise up in you. We began.
We started out at JFK and checked in through all the security, climbed onto the plane and squeezed into those little tiny spaces that, that, that you have in coach, uh, where you, if you drop something, you have to wait until the end of the flight to be able to bend over enough to be able to pick it up. Flew out of JFK, you can see some of New York City down below there. And a mere 10 and a half hours later, we were flying over Israel. We got in and checked through all their things, took another PCR test for COVID, and everybody was negative, and we were welcomed into Israel. Now that's enough about just our, our experience traveling, uh, and there will be some of it throughout the rest of this, uh, this presentation, this sermon, but... Most of it will be focused on following chronologically some of Jesus' uh, birth, life, ministry, and Holy Week in Jerusalem. So let's start with Bethlehem. Here's the Church of the Holy Nativity. It's a, a large building, but it really is actually three buildings. You can see on the left, number one, that's the Catholic section, and number two is the center section, which is run by the Greek Orthodox, and the right one, number three, that, that whole right section is the Armenian church. Now, if you look right in the very center, you can see people gathered around a spot, and let me zoom in on that. You can see, this is the door into the church. You can hardly see it. You can see up here where there's an arch, and then it came down like this. That was filled in so that it was a very small door, maybe this high, that, um, well, not, not there. It was, it was down here, and you had to bend over to go into the church of uh, the Nativity. They wanted you to humble yourself as you came in. So you came in through this humble entryway, and what do you see? You see a beautiful church. Let's see a little bit more of it here. Look up front at all the gold and the, the hanging lights. The uh, Greek Orthodox were having a funeral service in memory of a man, and so they were gathered. We weren't able to go right up to it, but a little later I was able to get up closer, and you can see the 12 disciples along here in, in this row and all the gold. What a beautiful spot for the Holy Nativity. This is where Jesus was born. Now, when I think of where Jesus was born, I think of a, uh, an inn that had no room, and I think of a stable out back. But that is no longer. They built a church on top of it, and so you go around back, and there's this little entryway that you get to go down the steps and inside, and down in there, they have marked a spot in gold uh, with a star. I don't know if you can see the, the star right in there. Um, and so we're touching, that apparently is, according to tradition, the spot where Jesus was born. Now you have to kind of take into account the fact that just about every place that we're going to see, they think is where it happened. It might not be exactly where it happened, but it's probably close. So this is at least close. Now that's where he was born. You can see us uh, up close a little bit, and you can see us touching it. And then around the corner is a spot that they have marked where they believe the uh, manger was kept. So that was in there. It doesn't look like a manger any longer. It's just a holy spot. We were in there. Uh, here's another shot of it from another angle. We were in the, the little tomb area, and we started to sing a hymn. And the, uh, the Greek Orthodox priest who was in there told us all to be quiet. <laughs> and, and it turns out, that the, I mentioned those three churches, uh, one of the Greek Orthodox priests later explained to us that the whole complex is run by three different organizations, the Catholics, the Greek Orthodox, and the Armenians, and they take turns of what hours they're in charge. So we were there during the Greek Orthodox time, and uh, it's, it's not fought over, but it's, it's shared between all three, and they each have their own section of that church. So if you come out of the main sanctuary and go down this little hallway to a door here, 
it opens into the courtyard off to the side of that main sanctuary, and now you're looking at the Catholic portion of the Church of the Nativity. This is our group about to go in, and when you go in, what do you see? You see this church. Uh, this is the Catholic side, and as I understand it, every Christmas they uh, live stream Christmas Eve from this spot. Now, each of the three religions has their own Christmas day because they each go by different calendars. So the Catholics get the whole complex on December 25th, and the Greek Orthodox get the whole complex on January the 7th, the Orthodox Christmas, and the Armenians go by a, a different calendar, and theirs is like a January 17th. So then they get full possession of the place on that day. So just looking around uh, in the... In this cathedral, uh, you see one of their statues to Mary, and I think it's called the Church of St. Catherine. There's another place where there's a, a statue of St. Catherine. So that's, that's where Jesus was born. But then Jesus, after fleeing to Egypt, he and his parents uh, left the town where they had to be there for the census, and they went back home up to Nazareth. Uh, Instead of talking about his childhood just yet, let's look at where Mary came from. Mary is from Nazareth, and this is the church, uh, the church of the Annunciation. Uh, Annunciation means announcing. This is uh, celebrating the fact that Mary was approached by an angel and, and told that she would be the, the mother of Jesus, the mother of God. And so they call it the Church of the Annunciation. Our guide pointed out the fact that she says it should be the Church of the Annunciations because Joseph also was visited by an angel and she thought he should get equal billing. <laughs> Here's the front of it, and uh, you can see some of the words there are written in Latin. This was, this was built uh, in the 1900s before Vatican II, and so they were still using Latin as their main language, and so the words on the front are written in Latin. And when they were building it, they sent out word to the whole world, to the whole Catholic Church, saying, we're building this church to honor Mary, and we would love for each country to send us a, a painting or some kind of artwork about Mary. And they got so many from all the different countries in the world, they couldn't fit them all in the church. So we're out in the courtyard looking, and there's a wall down this side, down the right side, and a wall down the other side that have the leftover paintings and artwork about Mary. So you can see, here's one, here are a couple of them from Iraq and Andorra. Here they are from Bolivia, and that's the one from Andorra. Uh, there's the one, their own, from Nazareth. Uh, here's one from Ireland. You can see one from Armenia and Egypt. And I think that says Singapore, and that says, I can't read. Well, anyway, <laughs> a lot of them. There's El Salvador and Wales, and on down, you can see how many there are down this wall. This is an interesting one that I took a special picture of because it's from Ukraine. And they made the point that some of the, some of the countries that have sent artwork have done so and no longer exist or have been absorbed. And I wondered at the time, would there still be a Ukraine in a month or two uh, to be represented by this? So you go into the church, and this is one of the only uh, large churches that has two floors, two main floors. So you go in and you go downstairs, and below the, the lower level has what they believe is Mary's house. Uh, so it's, it's in that section there in the middle. There's another picture of it from another angle. And then here we are up close, uh, being able to look into Mary's house. There's, of course, discussion as to whether this actually is Mary's house. Uh, our guide's sister has done extensive research, and she believes Mary's house is actually across the street. <laughs> Others believe it's up, the, up a block up the street, but again, we're pretty close. And does it really matter? They kept pointing out to us all throughout the trip. Does it really matter if this is actually it? Or 
Do you experience it? Do you know that this goes back to that time, that it's certainly within the area? So then you go upstairs, and here is the sanctuary upstairs. Not too impressive that way, but if you get up close, uh, it's kind of washed out in the, the picture here. This is Jesus standing here, and disciples, and family, and everybody around him. But we learned pretty quickly that when you go into a church like this, you always have to remember to look up, because there's always something special up above in the dome. Uh, this is this is a very nice one. It has a, a, when you're there, kind of a 3D effect when you're looking at it. So as I mentioned, some of the, the bigger uh, artwork from different countries was in the church itself. This is the one from Portugal. It has different uh, pictures of Mary and her story in, in set, inset in the wall. And here is the one from the USA. And it's one of the only ones that's in 3D. Uh, you can see the shadow of the hand here as it comes down and, and is there, so you can tell it's kind of sticking out from the wall, and it's the only artwork in the, uh, out of all the countries that has an explanation so that people know what they're seeing. <laughs> Outside the church, there is the statue of Mary and a labyrinth. Have you ever seen a prayer labyrinth before? This is where you can... It's, it's one continuous maze that begins here and behind her exits over there and you walk it and you go around and it takes you all around uh, the statue and you can pray and uh, just have a, a time of meditation. So that's where Mary came from and around the corner is a little tiny synagogue. Now it's, it's not very um, well advertised. See that door there? That's into the synagogue. And they believe that this is probably the synagogue that Joseph and Mary and Jesus went to as he was growing up. So let's go inside. There's uh, our tour guide, Prada. And uh, it's not very large, uh, not very imposing. Had wonderful acoustics. Uh, we sang a hymn in there, and nobody shooed us out. And, and it was very nice. Uh, here's, here's one of... Just looking at the very front of it, uh, not, probably not as big as this fellowship hall, but uh, benches along both sides where people could sit and listen and hear the, the scripture read and hear the, the rabbi teach about it. Here we are leaving, so you can see looking back, there's the door and the little uh, stained glass window above it. So not a whole lot there, but this is probably where Jesus grew up, probably one of the synagogues that he would have attended and gone to. So now we're going to go to where Jesus did his ministry. Um, I learned that about 90% of Jesus' ministry was around the Sea of Galilee, but it didn't begin there. We're going to first go down to the Jordan River. Now this was very moving to the two of us to see the Jordan River pretty much like you would kind of picture it. Palm trees, uh, the water flowing by, it's a little higher than usual. It's often a little, little lower and less. Uh, of course, there's this little amphitheater along the edges, but uh, you can see the water and, and, and some steps to be able to go down and step into it. So we did. Uh, this is another angle of it, and you can see it uh, coming in from the north and, and going down south. There it is. And to me, this is what I pictured when I thought of the Jordan River and going to see it. Uh, our tour guides did an excellent job, and they had us step down into the water, and they put water on our heads, and we were able to uh, kind of revisit and, and renew our baptismal vows. That's Kay. Afterwards, I'm in, I'm in line over here waiting my turn. Now, an interesting thing, we're, we're thinking back to when Jesus was here and he met John the Baptist and he was baptized here and the, the dove came down and the voice that said, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. But there's a little bit of uh, incongruence between that and sitting there uh, today. You notice two young women there. Uh, you can see the machine gun sticking off of, sitting on her lap. Uh, guarding the border. This is the border 
because on the other side over here is Jordan. And uh, you can look and see across the border that there's a, a guard over there as well and the Jordanian flags uh, that are flying. This is an international border and they don't want people crossing illegally. And so they've got guards on both sides. In Israel, we learned that young men, when they graduate high school, serve in the military for three years before they then can go off to college. The young women have to serve in the military as well, but only for two years. I'm going to go back just real quick. My guess is that these, I go backwards? Yeah, that these two young women probably were 19, 20 years old, sitting there guarding the border with uh, their guns. So Jesus, after his baptism, went out into the wilderness. And this is down south of Jerusalem, uh, the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is up north. Then you have the Jordan River. You have Jerusalem. And then you have, you have the Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Jerusalem. And then down here in the southern part, the Dead Sea. And surrounding the Dead Sea, and it's called that because it is dead. I mean, it's... It's, it's a very large sea, and it's very dead. It's 30% salt, whereas the ocean is 6%. So it's got five times as much salination in it as the ocean, and nothing can live in it. Um, we did get to go in it later, and I'll be showing some of those slides in uh, my Lenten class. But this is the uh, desert that Jesus went into. You can see it is very deserty. Uh, you see a little bit of the uh, reflection of the, the windows on our bus as we were driving by and seeing just how desolate it was. So Jesus then went up to, from there, after his 40 days in the wilderness and surviving the temptations, went up to the Sea of Galilee. Uh, the Sea of Galilee is not as big as the Dead Sea. Dead Sea is the lowest place on earth. Uh, the Sea of Galilee is, is regular fresh water. Uh, it's like a very large lake, almost like one of the uh, Great Lakes. And we came in here to the, and picked up our tour guide that day from Magdala, which I guess I'd never realized when we talk about Mary Magdalene that she is Mary from Magdala. She's a Magdalene from Magdala. So Mary Magdala, uh, Mary Magdalene was there. So we picked her up, and you can see all the different things all around the... Uh, Sea of Galilee that Jesus did, and we're going to hit a few of those, but like I said, 90% of his ministry was there around the Sea of Galilee. First thing we did uh, when we got off the bus was head towards a, an enclosed area that had a tarp over it because it was raining on us, and it poured for a little bit. But I, I stepped on down to the water's edge and took a picture of the Sea of Galilee. And I don't know about you, but... This is what I picture in my mind when I think of Jesus uh, near the Sea of Galilee. You can see across to the other side. You can picture that on a, a stormy day or a stormy night that those waves could really get whipping up. Uh, you can picture the disciples in a boat with Jesus in the back sleeping. And as the storm comes up, they say, Jesus, wake up, save us. We're going we're gonna to drown. And he gets up and stills the water or the time that they were out fishing late at night and it, a storm came up and they saw Jesus walking across the water to them. So I, I just, I love this image. It, it really, really gets me. So we went under this tarp uh, to get out of the rain while our tour guide talked to us a little bit about Galilee and I uh, just had to throw this in. While we were sitting there, this cat came up and sat on my lap and was a bit wet and I think just made herself comfortable on my lap and got warm and, and stayed dry underneath. And I had this cat on my lap. We named her Jesus. <laughs> Sat on my lap the whole time we were sitting there. But the rain let up, and the cat went her way. And we went around uh, up, up a little ways up a hill and came across the ruins of a synagogue. And they're pretty sure that this... The, these ruins are from a Jewish synagogue, not a uh, pagan temple or anything. Because if you look here, you can see the Star of David on the column. And then on another column, here is the menorah up top. And it's hard to see, but there's a little bit right there. 
is a, a shofar, one of those horns that they blow come prayer time. So between the two things and then this one, where again, they, you see the uh, Star of David, and then this one, where you see the Ark of the Covenant. When the Jews were in Israel for 40 years, uh, they had gotten the Ten Commandments, and they carried it with them. And how did they do that? They did, didn't have, throw it in a backpack. They put it in this Ark. This is the Ark of the Covenant. You can see it has columns. It's a large uh, structure. You can see wheels down here that they would have pulled it. And this is what went into the Holy of Holies in the temple when it was built. So they've taken some of these pieces and started recreating. This is all fairly new. They're, they're digging all over Israel, uncovering all kinds of things. And here they're recreating the temple and putting some of the pieces in place. You see it being supported there. A little closer up, you can see it being uh, supported and some of the writing on it that was written later than when it was. So they think this might have been, now we're up in Capernaum, which is around the Sea of Galilee. And as we read in our scripture today, this is where Jesus kind of made his home base. Uh, I guess I always thought of Jesus just traveling all over the countryside and stopping and maybe pitching a tent or something. But most of his ministry was around the Sea of Galilee, and he had a home base there. And this is a synagogue where most likely he often would have gone in and preached and taught and shared his, his musings and his wisdom with other people. So now just below this, closer to the water, this is up on a little bit of a rise, below that are, is what they're uncovering, uh, a town there in Capernaum, and they have come across uh, what they believe is the house of Peter. Uh, so they have uncovered it uh, as much as they can, and so to preserve it, they, instead of putting a church on top of it, they put this building that, uh, as you can see over here, uh, has plexiglass over top of it, so you can look down in and see the house. And the reason that they believe that this house down there might have been Peter's is that it dates back that far, and on one of the walls were written the names Peter and Jesus. Now, we know that Jesus, in one of his miracles, uh, healed Peter's mother-in-law, which means Peter would have been married. He had a mother-in-law there living with him. Maybe Jesus was hanging out there. That, this could have been Jesus' home base, where he and Peter and the other disciples stayed in Capernaum, and from there did their ministry doing uh, different teachings and miracles. So just up the road from that is the... Uh, Church of the Beatitudes. We heard our choir sing about the Beatitudes today. They did a lovely job. There are eight Beatitudes, and so inside the church, it's an octagonal building, and on each of the walls inside, uh, and here is the, the altar there in the middle, but if you look up, you can see each of the Beatitudes written on each of the, one on each of the eight walls. And of course, when you go into a church, you should do what? Look up. And so you look up and you see this beautiful golden dome with the blue representing the sky above it. Now throughout the grounds of this, now this is not, they don't claim that this is where Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. It's down the hill. They believe it's up at the top of the hill, so instead of doing it right where he did it, where he gave the uh, Sermon on the Mount, they believe that uh, it was better to commemorate it down at the bottom of the hill. And so throughout the grounds are these uh, places where each of the Beatitudes are listed. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. All eight are uh, on the ground throughout the grounds, and you can stop and meditate and think about that. And then Jesus concludes his Beatitudes with this phrase, where he says, Let anyone who thirsts come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture says, Rivers of living water flow within them, within him, within them. And uh, this is a bit of an ironic little side note. It's down a, a side path to get to it. Uh, and it's, it's very nice in that it says, anyone who thirsts, come to me and drink. And then here is a, uh, a fountain right over there that um, has water flowing. So it, it really brings home the point. But then you've got this sign down here that says, water not for drink. <laughs> so, 
Anyone who comes and thirsts, come to Jesus for drink, but don't drink the water. <laughs> so from there, we went to a place I've never heard this name before, Tabga. And Tabga is where they talk about the miracle of the multiplication. What was, what was multiplied that Jesus did? The loaves and fishes. And so they believe this is the spot where Jesus did the feeding of the multitude. And they show the spot and where their, uh, where their church is and all of that. But also, below, on this is the top half of the sign. Look at the bottom half of the sign. And then they show some of the other things that Jesus did around the Sea of Galilee. Calling of the Apostles, which is what we heard in our reading today. Sermon on the Mount. Uh, a healing, a couple of healings. Miracle of the multiplication. Jesus walks on the water. Jesus preaching and healing in Capernaum, uh, where he said woe to the unrepentant cities, meeting with Peter and his companions after the resurrection, uh, and the, the cooking of fish on the beach after he uh, resurrected, and his final appearance. So a lot of it happened around the Sea of Galilee. Now, one of those things uh, that happened around there, do you know about Peter's fish and why, why it's important? I'd, I'd never read this in the Bible, but they read it out of the Bible, so I know it must be there. Apparently, one of the, uh, the local officials came to Peter and said, doesn't your, doesn't your master pay taxes? And so Peter went to Jesus and said, don't we pay taxes? And Jesus said, yes, we do. What I want you to do is go down to the, down to the sea and cast your hook out into the water, and the first fish you catch, uh, cut it open, and you'll find a, a valuable coin inside and use that to pay our taxes. Have you ever heard that before? No. I hadn't either. But apparently, Peter's fish uh, had a coin in it. And so we went to a restaurant, and we had fish. And here was mine. I should have warned you uh, ahead of time. Uh, that, that was my lunch. And the person sitting next to me had this one. And if you notice, there's a coin in its mouth. So she, she got lucky. Apparently, that's good luck if you get a fish with a coin in, coin in its mouth. But let's, let's look again at the Sea of Galilee and see from a little higher up perspective to be able to look out and, and see it and know that this is where Jesus did so much of his ministry. And part of our experience was to take a ride out on that water. Uh, we went out on this, uh, this far out dock and caught a boat and we all got to ride on it and be out on the Sea of Galilee and uh, sing some hymns, and we did communion on the boat, and you can, you can see it from quite a distance away, how small it is compared to the rest of the sea. But out on the boat, you look out and you see the waters, and again, it was kind of an overcast. This day was hot, it was cold, it was rainy, it was sunny, it was a little bit of everything, and it kept coming and going. So apparently the weather there around Galilee is very changeable. But you can look out and see the water, you can look out, and, and if, you, if you notice, there's a town on this side, and when it talks about Jesus uh, crossed the sea, he got in the boat and he crossed the sea to go to another town, you can see that there are towns all around it. Here's, a, here's another one. You can, you can see a little bit of dwellings over here and some dwellings over here. Uh, and then the, the mountains, the high hills behind it, where Jesus at one point probably would have had to ascend up to the top of the mountain for the transfiguration, you can see how tall they are compared to the water. And this is just one of the two of us uh, standing with the Sea of Galilee behind us. But uh, I, I love this picture because if you notice, it's a little hard to see, but there's, there's kind of this glow around K. <laughs> you notice there isn't, there isn't one around me. <laughs> so... Jesus has done his, his ministry for three years up around the Sea of Galilee. He heads down to Jerusalem. Now we're coming into the, to the fourth of four parts. Uh, when, when Jesus uh, came to Jerusalem, he, came from, he was uh, staying at Lazarus' house, and then he came from Lazarus' house and started on this hillside. This is the Mount of Olives. And you can see that it's filled with olive trees. There's still, it's up a, up a hill. The way 
uh, this works is there's the Mount of Olives up here, and it goes down to a valley down below, which is the Kidron Valley, and then it goes back up the hill, and then there is Jerusalem on top of that other hill. So Jesus is starting from here, and from this vantage point a little higher up, you can look over and see <coughs> Jerusalem. Uh, this is the Dome of the Rock, which is a Muslim mosque, which was built on top of where the temple would have been. It was built around in the 600s, so uh, long after Jesus was there. But before that, in Jesus' time, uh, there was the Jewish temple. And that's right where that would have been, right in that spot. And can you see this square over here, this big open square there? Uh, anybody know who built that? It was built between 20, and 20 AD and 20 uh, BC, somewhere in that time period. It was built by Herod the Greek. Herod, the one that uh, was chasing after Jesus when he was born and wanted to have him killed, he had that whole square built right, at, right alongside where the Jewish temple was. Here's a little more of a close-up to it. You can see how big it is. It's a very large square. Now, this is a recreation of Jerusalem we saw at a museum. You can see the people over here uh, and how big they are compared to it. It's probably about half a football size in in. Uh, width, and uh, you can see the Jewish temple there. This is how it would have looked in Jesus' day, right in the middle, which we saw on the last picture, and now has the Dome of the Rock on top of it. And this is the administration building, where, and down here are the steps that you would take in and come up through and come into this administration building. If you had a sacrifice, they would inspect it, and then you could go across to the temple. Outside the temple, uh, Gentiles were allowed. The first courtyard is the court of women, where they were allowed in. That's how close they could get. Then you get into the courtyard of men and priests. And then inside that door is uh, the holy area where only priests were allowed. And then around back, behind it, was the Holy of Holies, where they kept the Ark of the Covenant. When they had it, it had been lost over time. Uh, in Jesus' day, the room, they said, would have been empty. Uh, and only the, the, the high priest on the Day of Atonement could go in there and uh, ask prayers of God for the people to be uh, forgiven. So that's, that's that. Uh, Jesus, when he came down from the Mount of Olives on Palm Sunday, would have come down that valley, down that hill, and to the valley and back up. And his goal was probably this gate right in here. So let's see a little bit more. This is the way down the hillside to uh, Jerusalem. And back then, there probably wouldn't have been walls. It probably would have just been hillside. And that's where people would have been putting their coats and their palm branches for Jesus to walk on, hailing him as he headed towards the city. You can see the Dome of the Rock, so that's where the temple would have been. He's coming down this hillside. This is the Mount. Uh, he came down the Mount of Olives, and now this is the valley down below, the Kidron Valley below, and then he would have come up a, a street over here and then up to a gate, which probably, oh, the gate was right there. It's, it's all blocked up now. You can't go in it. But he would have worked his way up and into that gate to be able to go along the wall. This is the eastern wall of Jerusalem. And here's, here's another picture of us coming down, the, uh, down from the Mount of Olives on the is the way Jesus would have on Palm Sunday. And again, we're back to that, um, that model. Jesus would have come down the valley and back up and in this gate, which doesn't lead up to the Temple Mount. There's a, there would be a passageway inside here along the eastern wall and bring you out somewhere over here to these steps over here. Now, this is the western wall along here, and we're going to see a little bit about that. Uh, we're going to go in here and out across these steps and over to this corner over here. So now we're looking, this is a depiction of what it probably would have looked like in Jesus' day. Uh, and there's this long street all along the western wall. And probably around in here underneath this archway is where the uh, money changers would have been. And Jesus overturned their tables and said, you're, you're perverting our religion, so get out of here. And then he would have gone up to these steps and in here to go up to the temple. This is what it looks like today. You can see where that arch would have been that came down and the street 
would have been right along here, and over here behind this uh, jet out portion are the steps. So here is that street now that they've uncovered a lot of. They're, as I said, they're digging a lot of it. But this is the way uh, where all kinds of commerce would have been happening and people going up and down and uh, coming around this corner then go into the temple to give their sacrifice. So now this is farther up that wall at the Western Wall. And you've heard of the Western Wall? I think it was called the Wailing Wall for a while. Yeah. Uh, so you can see it there, and where, as you approach closer, there's a place where you can ritually wash yourself, and then over here is a little um, caddy that holds yarmulkes, and to approach the wall, you have to put one on and look like this before you go up to the wall so that you're uh, humbled, your, your, your head is covered, and you work your way up to the wall through the people, and you're uh, able to write a prayer and put it in the wall, which is what I did. So now this is back around the, uh, let's see if that's the western side and this is the eastern side. This would be the southern wall of the temple. And this is where the steps are going up in and it's all covered. The, the, dirt, the dirt used to come up to about here. Let's see if I can do this better. Along here. And they've, they've excavated all of this out and found these steps. And they've uh, they put a little uh, stand with a circle that you could look through and see the steps. And it has an overlay in it of what it probably would have looked like back then. So you can see these, these are the actual steps behind it. You're looking, it's a clear overlay. And then they've added things to it to make it look uh, more like what it would have looked like in Jesus' day. So Jesus, from uh, entering on Palm Sunday, throwing out the money changers, going into the temple, uh, all that week he preaches and teaches a lot, and a, a lot of the book of John and some of the others are just filled with his teachings during that holy week. Uh, now we're up in top of a, a synagogue looking out over the city, and you can see the Dome of the Rock, which is where the temple would have been. This is the... Uh, Mount of Olives across here where Jesus came down. And at the end of that week, on Thursday, he had communion with his disciples. Uh, he had his last supper. And then he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, which is near the base of the Mount of Olives. And so here's where he would have gone and prayed. And his disciples fell asleep while he was praying. And it's where uh, Judas came and betrayed him. And not on top of it, but near it, they built a church, a uh, the church uh, there for Gethsemane. And you go inside, and this is what you see. Uh, there is Jesus praying on a rock, and knowing that uh, his time is almost over. There's a painting inside of it with Jesus being betrayed by Judas. And of course, when you go into a church, you should do what? Look up. Look up. So... There's the ceiling above you as you approach the front. And when you get to the very front, you look up and see this, another beautiful dome. Uh, Jesus was convicted and sentenced to death. And they beat him and they put a crown of thorns on him. And they believe this is what the crown of thorns would have looked like back then. And he was crucified on Golgotha. And... Golgotha is now inside the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. It's, uh, again, you think of a hillside and a, and a rock and three crosses up on top, but now there's a church on top of it, and you can only see a little bit of it. This is uh, the entryway into it, and you walk in, and this is what you see, and of course you should look where? Up. up. So let's look up, and you see the, the beautiful dome with Jesus above. And this, they think, is the rock of Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified. It's under plexiglass inside a beautiful church. Uh, above it is this, this hanging to remind you that this is where Jesus died. When, his, when he was dead, they laid his body on this slab to prepare it for burial. Uh, this is the spot where they think Jesus was buried. They put a like a church on top of it, inside the church. Um, we were only one of the very first tour groups to come in, and they say this, this is kind of like Disney World 
uh, in regular times, non-COVID times, it can take you hours to get in and see the spot, and we only had to wait a, a couple of minutes. But uh, we looked up, and there's this beautiful dome above it, and the, the tomb where he lay is just inside this little door. You're not allowed to take pictures in there. You can only go in two or three at a time, uh, see it, and come right back out so the next people can come in. Uh, nearby is another tomb, and this gives you a, a better sense of what a tomb is like. And one of the slots where they would put bodies. And uh, that, that pretty much brings us to the conclusion Buzz, could I get a little bit of light, at least? Or we can, we can go full light. That's okay. Let's get them all. Um, those are our pictures of the Holy Land, where Jesus was born and grew up and ministered and went through all the events of Holy Week in Jerusalem. But of all the things that we saw, one of the most important was what we didn't see. We didn't see in this tomb a body because Jesus rose at Easter, and he overcame death, and is still our living Lord. But that's uh, getting ahead of our story. That's for Easter. We still have to get through Lent. Let's do that. Um, for now, let's continue our Lenten journey and our pilgrimage toward Holy Week and Easter. Let us pray. Loving God, thank you for the opportunity to go where the events of the Bible happen and to see and hear and taste and smell and touch and experience what we've read about for so long. Thank you for your ministry, your life and death, and resurrection. May we journey this Lenten season with you and grow closer to you along the way. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>
There are a few announcements to bring to your attention today. First is that uh, in this season of Lent, we are collecting for the one great hour of sharing. And half of that will go towards Camp Johnsonburg, which was one of only two places in the country that trained people to build wells in third world countries. So that's important work to support. But the other half of it goes to our PCUSA headquarters, where they divvy it up in different ways. And some of that is going to support churches who are uh, working with refugees from Ukraine. So uh, as you're able, please give to the One Great Hour Sharing. And even more directly, a local Rotary has made arrangements to take items that we donate over there to countries where refugees are pouring in. And God knows there are millions of them. So uh, in the bulletin are listed all the things that they would like to collect and send over. First aid kits, sleeping bags, even diaper cream for children. Uh, it's listed there in the bulletin. Uh, as you are able to collect something, we will have a spot probably about where Dave is sitting over there. Dave? Uh, we'll put it on the table over there. And uh, there's, there's no timeline. There's no deadline. You can just keep bringing things in as you're able. And when we get a car load, we'll take them down to Fairview Lake where they're collecting them to take over uh, to help the refugees. Uh, on, back on that table, again near Dave, but we all know where he is now. Uh, near that are the giving envelopes, so if you haven't picked yours up yet, please do so. Uh, we are getting close to the time that we normally send out care packages to college students. We want to let them know that they're remembered and cared for. So if you're thinking, oh, I need to pick up something for Ukraine, maybe along the way you could grab a bag of candy or some cookies to uh, drop off here. Uh, and that collection spot is out in the hallway. I also want to mention Roy Haviland's memorial service this coming Saturday up at the Fire Hall at Frankfurt at 11 a.m. We'll be meeting there to remember Roy and, uh, and, and be together in support. Let's take a little bit of time now. Were there any uh, prayer concerns on the prayer list? Okay, well, I have some from the Internet, so we'll include those. Let's take a little bit of time in silence to offer our, our prayers for the people in Ukraine, for world peace, uh, for our own Lenten journeys, and the people that we know of that need God's care. Let's do so in silence, followed by a pastoral prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and merciful God, we pray today for the Ukrainian people and ask for your intervention in this war levied against them by Russia. We pray, O oh God, for peace and the laying down of weapons. We pray for all those who fear for tomorrow, that your spirit of comfort would draw near to them. We pray for those with power over war and peace, that they would have wisdom and discernment and compassion in guiding their decisions. We pray for restoration and renewed hope. We pray for the families, especially the children at risk and in fear, that you would hold and protect them living through the horrors of war and all the upheaval and tribulation it brings. We also pray for those protesting in Russia against these violent acts. We ask that you would protect, cover, and keep them as they, put it, as they stand up for what is just and righteous. We pray for the entire world community, including the leaders in our own country, that you would give them wisdom and ingenuity to respond in ways that end this war and move us all to a world where your peace abides. Hear the cries of your people, O oh God. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Hear our prayers for the people of Israel, the Christians there, the Muslims, Jews, Druze, Palestinians, Baha'i, Bedouin, and others who inhabit that much fought over territory. May they find a way to coexist and live peacefully with each other. Here are prayers for our brothers and sisters in the faith that we have named today who need your help, including Lisa, Sandy Tickner's family, Irene, John and Mark, Cheryl Howard, Fred Kilpatrick, Gabe Titus, and the family of Leslie Harris, with Sylvia and Harry and Bonnie. Ed and Heather and Grace, 
Charles and Marie, Kip Cash, that Ron Meyer get well, or Linda and Anna Clausen, Lewis and Jude. You've heard our prayers in the silence, and we know that you hear and respond lovingly. So hear our prayers now as we pray the prayer your son taught us when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God is the foundation of all good, and has showered us with bounteous blessings. In gratitude, let us give of who we are in return, our, heart, our hearts, minds, energies, and resources. We ask that you take a minute to use one of the ways listed in the bulletin to make your offering. Thank you. Let us pray. O oh God, your gifts are all around us, and especially in this community of hope, love, and peace. May the gifts we return to you this day be a sign of our commitment to do your work in our neighborhood and in the world, and to promote loving ways for all your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please take a minute online to leave a greeting so that all may see who is worshiping with us, and here in person, please also greet your neighbors. Nice to see you all. Nice to see all our faces. journey. Let us go as pilgrims, not just sightseers. Let us go with our heads, but also with our hearts, as we learn about God, as we walk with him, as we serve in his name. Let us go in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who is with us now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Also, that uh, to, you can you can keep. I'll talk over you. Uh, tonight we're doing uh, the first of four weeks of uh, Lenten class, and if you'd like to see more, this is really just a, a small bit of the pictures and the experiences we had. Uh, let me know, and I'll get you the uh, Zoom link.
we are.